Chicago's best ideas. This year, the idea was to um, focus on great Chicago ideas and either react to them or show that they're right. Or in this case, what I'm going to try to do is show that they're wrong. And the idea I'm picking up, I could show you the book if you could see me, is a, 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 a book that Eric Posner wrote with a very well-known professor, Adrian Vermeule. Adrian used to be here and now he's left for Harvard. And he is kind of a very interesting thinker these days. He's become what he calls an integralist, a Catholic the theoretician, I guess you'd say, who thinks that the, all the power of the United States government, which he thinks is formidable, should be used to impose Catholic doctrine on the rest of us. Um, and when he was here, he was well known as a, I guess, somewhat conservative, but extremely good constitutional lawyer. Eric and he wrote a book called The Executive Unbound some years ago. And uh, I'll explain what that argument was, but what I'm gonna do is talk about what the COVID crisis tells us about their theory of the executive unbound. So uh, Cassie, if you could go actually to the fourth slide. Keep going. There, one more, there we go, perfect. So um, this is a, a problem that's, that's a very old problem in constitutional theory. You know, what do we do when normal government rules would endanger all of us, right? Um, and it's the problem of emergency rule that the Romans actually did a lot of important thinking about. But in some ways, like many other ideas, we, our public law still goes back to the Romans. They had this notion that, you know, during normal times, normal law would govern. And then um, every once in a while, you would have some kind of crisis. And they created this institution called the dictatorship, which now we use as an epithet. But a dictator, for the Romans was someone to whom all power would be given uh, for a temporary period in situations of great necessity. And that person would be called, usually it was a retired general, they would call him back from some farm to uh, you know, save the city through exercise of whatever power was necessary, total power. Um, and then his power would disappear as soon as the emergency was over, the crisis was solved, or he was brought back to, um, or, or six months passed. Those were the constraints. And so a regular part of Roman governance worked really well. The key was that there were temporal limits, of course, and also that they had a separation of who could call the emergency from who could exercise emergency power. So we still see this sometimes in the idea that a legislature must call an emergency in it constitutional system. And um, um, so let's see. I hope this is going to work. I'm just, there's something. Okay. I hope you guys can still hear me, right? Good. I believe so. I think I got rid of that old other Zoom. Um, okay. So um, we in modern times have wrestled with reviving this Roman idea of temporary government, suspension of the normal rules of government. And there's a big debate over whether law could actually operate here. Machiavelli, who revived a lot of Roman principles for the um, Italian Republic, said, yes, of course, we need law because there's a kind of a moral hazard. If we let the dictator come in without any constraint, they will just you know, run rampant, take over the system, a kind of fear of authoritarianism. Others like John Locke in the Ang Anglo-American tradition um, thought, you know, there's just some things where law runs out. There's no possible way that we can actually constrain this. It's what he called a prerogative power of the sovereign to figure out when there's a state of emergency or a state of exception. So that's kind of the, the deep background of the debate. Cassie, if you could do the next slide, that'd be great. Great, all right. So along comes um, Posner and Vermeule some years ago. This is a book that they wrote in the aftermath of, or during the war on terror, I guess you'd say. And it's called The a Executive Unbound. And they made a claim that emergency rule was a period where the executive could not be constrained, that courts were too slow and lacked the information and decisiveness to constrain, for law to really constrain the executive, that Congress was too, you know, lame generally to do anything. And so there was a natural flow of power to the executive. And they further argued that 
not only was this the characteristic of emergency periods like during the war on terror, but it was characteristic of all modern law that the administrative state had become executive governance, uh, you know, ad infinitum, and there was no possibility really of law constraining. So that was their view. And um, that was, uh, uh, you know, what they argued and seemed to make some sense in the war on terror, although there were some people who pushed back. Now against that, you could say that there are possibilities of limitation by law, that courts, for example, could ask whether measures are strictly necessary under the circumstances. The constitutional design nowadays tends to um, provide for emergency rule for only a temporal, temporally limited period, and those could be enforced by Congress or the courts. In fact, the most modern scheme is to have um, a state of emergency run for a particular period, and then extensions of it would require legislative approval. Um, another rule that we see a lot of, and this is really comes originally from international law, is non-discrimination in the application of emergency measures. And finally, um, the possibility of judicial oversight of particular measures. So all of those sort of institutional suggestions sort of go against the idea that the executive could be unbound. Uh, next slide. So there's a big debate still. And, and, and you know, in some sense, Vermeule in particular, and Posner, I am lumping in by association, are what we'd call Schmidians in legal theory. So the guy in the middle there is Carl Schmidt. And he was uh, famous as the theorist of Nazi Germany, which is why he's in the picture with the Nazi. Um, and basically his argument is that during periods of crisis, someone has to decide when an emergency occurs. And that person is in his view, the sovereign, that there's just a necessary um, element of discretion in every legal system. And even though of course he's you know, tainted by his association with Nazism, he, he keeps coming back. And people like Vermeule will think he's correct as a descriptive matter, and maybe even as a normative matter that maybe putting words in his mouth, but, Adrian would say we should use Schmidian power to enforce Catholicism and Catholic morality on the rest of us. That's what that's the mission of the state. Um, now, the man in the lower right is Viktor Orban, and he is the prime minister of Hungary. And he um, is worth thinking about these days because he used the COVID emergency. He's been kind of taking over the COVID system for, for uh, taking over the Hungarian political system for some time. And uh, when COVID hit, he decided to uh, declare, he had the, his parliament pass a law, which said basically that he could govern by decree as long as there was a COVID crisis, that he got to decide how long that crisis lasted, that no laws could constrain him. In other words, that he could govern without regard to existing legislation. So that's basically setting up a dictator, a Roman style dictator, except without even the temporal limit. And I think it's safe to say that he has now taken over the Hungarian political system completely. And in fact, is in the process of really undermining the European Union. He vetoed the budget this last week um, allowed for, because it had some conditionalities criticizing his takeover of the system. Okay, um, so this is kind of the, the issue. So what do we find? Um, go two slides down if you could, Cassie. So if, as I said before, there is um, a kind of, um, one more slide if you could. Yeah, so um, there's some international law on this. Just as Schmidt was writing his stuff, you know, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Universal Declaration, um, recognized that there was a need, gonna be a need for emergencies. And of course, all of the big deep background here is that Hitler used the emergency rule to take over Germany. And so there's a sense that we had to find ways to constrain it. And um, one of the ideas that was introduced was the idea of derogation from human rights obligations. So in normal times, of course, we have a right to you know, free speech, freedom of assembly, but we recognize that those rights are not absolute and could be constrained in particular time periods. And so um, the idea of derogation is that a state can, is supposed to notify the international bodies that it is temporarily pausing certain rights for a certain period. And this uh, article requires that it could only be to the extent strictly required. Um, notice also that they introduced the non-discrimination norm. So you couldn't, for example, say, well, we're gonna have a um, you know, temporary restriction on freedom of assembly, but we're gonna or let the uh, you know, synagogues open and not the mosques, right? Um, so you couldn't do something like that.
So this is how international law deals with it. And of course it assumes, you know, that the Schmidians are wrong, that law can constrain. Next slide, Cassie. I also, it, one of my big intellectual projects is to look at constitutions around the world. And we look at what post-war constitutions say, and they also seem to try to constrain uh, emergency power with law. So um, they, interestingly, they will typically state the kind of thing which is an emergency, which can create, uh, um, a, you know, which for which leaders can invoke emergency rule. And the most common one is war. You know, you see some on internal security. It's interesting that almost none mention pandemics or financial crises. And this is, I think, just illustrates the idea that law is always a little bit behind, right? It is probably the case that the most common kind of emergency going ahead is gonna be pandemics, financial crises, climate induced uh, disasters and such. And yet those aren't really addressed in constitutions because they tend to be older documents written you know, with sort of yesterday in mind. Okay, um, keep going, one more slide. Um, another kind of introduction is that there might be different levels of emergency. So here is in many areas, the United States constitution is completely out of date. A um, constitution written today would have these provisions for emergency rules stating what powers could be exercised, requirement of legality, all those things that where law is regulating. Um, the Spanish one I just bring up because it's kind of interesting. They have three different emergencies. They have a state of alarm in provision two, a state of emergency and a state of siege. And each of them requires higher thresholds of legislative vote in order to get into that state and um, it allows the executive more power, um, possibly for more time. So that's, the, that's a kind of attempt by law to regulate. Um, if you could go down two slides, Cassie. So no, uh, the other direction, um, keep going until you see the coronavirus. Now the coronavirus comes along. Okay, that's really what this paper of mine is about. Um, and what the paper does, I worked on it with a woman named Mila Verstig at, uh, at Virginia. And what we did is as soon as the COVID crisis hit, we started looking at how countries were responding, asking whether they invoked emergency rule and how they responded. The kind of test of the posner vermule thesis is, did the executive you know, determine the response unilaterally, which is their suggestion, because they say these other constitutional bodies have not no ability to, to, um, to, to contribute. And we did notice some examples where existing law did not seem to authorize the response. So this may illustrate, I suppose, a Schmidian point that law can run out, right? That, um, and yet governments may still have to act. And we, we have no problem with this. We're not legal formalists who think that, you know, there always has to be legal authorization. The question is, is when you react, do you use the kind of deep principles of, of the rule of law in reacting? So let me give the example of Taiwan. Taiwan, I should just say, is the jurisdiction which had the single best response uh, to coronavirus uh, anywhere. Their vice president was an epidemiologist. Their um, government in general is pretty good, it's a democratic government. They, of course, have a tradition uh, as someone who's spent time there um, you know, when people are sick, when they have an ordinary cold, they wear masks so as not to transmit the cold to others, very other regarding as in all the East Asian societies. But when the coronavirus hit, they felt that they had to undertake some measures that were not supported by existing law. So they prevented school groups from traveling abroad. They had a lockdown beyond probably what would have been allowed by prior law. So what did they do? They put these measures in and immediately went to the legislature for authorization. And they passed a coronavirus statute very quickly that authorized the, the executive to take these actions. So that's kind of what I mean by being in accordance with the principles of the rule of law. There were seven deaths in Taiwan. I wanna just emphasize that. Seven deaths from coronavirus in this island of a 23 million people. If, that, if the United States had taken these measures as effectively, we would have had 100 deaths, 100 deaths. We have 250,000 and we could have had 100 arguably. Now, um, 
so that's an example of law running out. And yet, you know, the, the government responding in a relatively, you know, rule of law democratic way. So, and there are other examples too. Um, Cassie, could you go on to the next slide? I just want to go through rather quickly. Um, one of the things we argue is that, you know, maybe this is a different kind of crisis than that which was motivating Vermeule and um, Posner. So if you think about it, and this is one of the contributions of the paper, I think, is we typologize crises. The paradigm of the crisis is a national security crisis, right, violent. And of course, those kind of crises arrive quickly. Um, you know, they may or last a, a long time or not. But information on what's needed to respond to this kind of crisis is generally really concentrated in the executive branch. And furthermore, there's typically a need for a uniform response. That is, if we're fighting a foreign enemy, we have to coordinate the response across the country really well. Um, and so perhaps that's the kind of crisis for which an executive concentration would make a lot of sense. Now, um, you might, and so we look at these other kinds of crises. A uh, financial crisis is also a, it's more of a human induced crisis, uh, but also has certain features of being you know, very concentrated response. There's only one central bank, only one ministry of finance. And so coordination at the center is really critical. If you think about the more modern, as I will call them, kinds of crises, natural disasters and pandemic, uh, you know, that's not really the case. First of all, like in a natural disaster, it doesn't hit the entire territory uniformly. It's typically localized. To respond to that, you need typically information that is not concentrated at the center, right? The need for information is actually gonna depend very much on local, um, qual local, local uh, actors. And by the way, this is all the more so true of a pandemic, right? Which um, emerges slowly. So there's not a need for quick executive action, might last a long time as this one is, and has highly decentralized information on the danger. You know, the information on what's going on is not held by the federal government. It's held by lots of private actors, insurance companies and hospitals. And information on how to respond is held by university researchers and as well as government scientists. But um, local government has to play a role as well in this. And so it's not the kind of crisis for which one would think that you need a concentrated response. And um, so that's basically the argument that there's kind of like that this one, we should expect to see other actors involved. Uh, next slide. What do we have? Well, when we look at around the world, we've seen a lot of interplay and dialogue among different branches of government. So just I'll talk about courts and then I'll talk about the legislatures. Um, in Kosovo, the government passed a lockdown decree that was not authorized by law. And the constitutional court said, you can't do that. You've got to go back and you know follow the letter of the law in adopting this thing. And they did. And they were able to lock down and, you know, delayed a week or two. Uh, Israel wanted to uh, implement a testing and a tracing regime, a cell phone tracing regime. So that's one of been a very effective response in Taiwan and Korea is that when if you come in to South Korea from the outside, they get your cell phone number and they follow you. They track you to make sure that you're really quarantining, not moving too far. And so Israel implemented this, but their law didn't allow that. It only allowed cell phone tracking for, for potential terrorists, not the general population or people who happen to be sick. So the court said you can't do that. And they had to go pass legislation too. So that shows you that the executive is not unbound. They're constrained. Um, proportionality is a general principle of constitutional law in which we try to make sure that whatever responses are needed are actually fitting the particular situation. And there are a lot of German cases, for example, in which the court said, no, this is okay, this one's not. And you can, those of you familiar with the United States have seen similar cases, right? The Sixth Circuit said, look, you can, you can have lockdowns, but you can't have special ones just for churches, for example. Um, or, you know, the lockdown has to be proportionate to the public health benefit. So we have the same kind of thing in our doctrine that we don't call it that. In Malawi, the prime minister, uh, the president, excuse me, wanted to suspend the election. And the court, and he had kind of stolen the election the previous year, the court said, no, you can't do that. You have to um, 
let us, you know, you have to hold the election and you can't even have a lockdown because that would interfere with the freedom of assembly, which is necessary to organize for the opposition. So they prevented a lockdown. So that's kind of interesting. I'm going to jump all the way to the last one. In Brazil and India, we saw the opposite. We saw courts that actually were going against governments that didn't want to have a lockdown. So Brazil is quite famous for this. Bolsonaro is the Brazilian Donald Trump. And he's a tough guy, you know, COVID's a little flu, shouldn't let it bother you, don't let it take over your life. And so um, uh, he, he was actually is using his government to, to put out misinformation about it. And the courts did a lot of things. First of all, at the subnational level, courts would order lockdowns even when the executive did not. That's quite a dramatic intervention if you think about it. Um, in addition, they prevented the government from spreading this disinformation through government channels. So another remarkable intervention. Um, and other things courts have done is be, you know, limit the uh, police abuse of people who are subject. So th there's been a lot of judicial involvement is the punchline here. Um, next slide. How about legislatures? Well, I already mentioned a couple examples. Um, in you know, Bolivia, there was an interim president at the time and she wanted to suspend the election. And the legislature said, no, you can't do that. Or they only allowed a limited suspension. She was basically trying to take over the system and they've just held that election and her party lost. So that's kind of a, a story of the legislature protecting democracy in uh, an emergency situation. In terms of statutes, the British bill is really quite good. It's a very, very sophisticated bit of statutory drafting, which um, sort of gives the government lots of powers in lots of different areas, but will automatically expire as soon as the um, virus is over. So this also addresses kind of the lingering fear that someone might use emergency power to take over the political system. Um, now, if you could go uh, uh, to the next slide. Of course, we do have examples of people who have taken over the political system. So I mentioned Viktor Orban before. And what we do uh, is that we look at other circumstances which might render a country vulnerable to democratic backsliding. The basic analogy here is that, you know, COVID goes and it hits individuals and some people get super sick and others do not. But if you've got a bunch of comorbidities, you got diabetes or you're, you know, very overweight or bad heart, you're likely to have worse medical conditions. And the same is true of government systems that are hit by COVID. You know, countries which are highly polarized have not had good responses, see the United States, Countries which have a history of instability or, you know, actually oil producers tend to be in this category um, or, you know, have a lot of poverty are basically not optimal grounds for democracy in the first place. And so um, when they, that means that we can characterize them as having comorbidities at risk of democratic backsliding. What the map does is color code these things. So countries which are in red are uh, at high risk Countries in orange, including the United States, are at medium risk, and countries in green are basically okay. The black countries are already dictatorships, nowhere to go but down. Uh, so uh, next slide, if you could. And finally, we do have some abuse of the, uh, of the powers. So Hong Kong, at the beginning of COVID, was still a liberal jurisdiction within China. Now it has been completely taken over. And you know, maybe that's because um, there was an opportunity while the world was not paying attention for China to fire the pro-democracy legislatures and such, pass a new national security law, which reaches even into wherever you are sitting here into the United States. Um, but that seems to be an instance of authoritarians taking advantage of the COVID. Uh, Erdogan, the Turkish leader up in the upper left, um, released prisoners from jail as was required by the courts because of health conditions, but didn't release anyone who was his political enemy. <laughs> he has a bunch of people in jail from the coup a few years ago. And so selective release of people from jail, that's a kind of uh, authoritarian type of response. And uh, many countries have adopted fake news laws about spreading disinformation involving COVID. Um, the guy in the lower left is Hun Sen of Cambodia. He used that to go after his tiny domestic opposition. So anytime you have emergency power, it can be abused. We have seen these things. But I suppose my 
punchline here is that these are relatively rare. There hasn't been uh, a lot of, you know, new dictatorships. There have been some dictatorships like Belarus, where the COVID response actually showed vulnerabilities in the system. And in any case, when we look at the whole array of countries, it's clear that the executive is not unbound. They're extremely limited in what they can do. They have to be in dialogue with other, um, with other sort of actors in the political system. Um, now, Cassie, you could stop sharing. I'm gonna talk a minute more. And I think my camera may be working now. We're gonna find out the hard way. Yes, it is working, my God. So, um, so that's like what's happened this year. When we added it up, we found that 80% of countries that we looked at, dictatorships or democracies, had some significant role for either the court, the legislature, or local government. Local governments played a big role, sometimes pushing back against the national government, as my discussion of Brazil illustrated, where local governments wanted to protect people and the national government didn't. So we are seeing genuine involvement of other actors. Um, the idea that emergency rule is a paradigm for all of government, even in non-emergency times, seems totally wrong to me. And I think, you know, in my discussions with Professor Posner, I think he would agree with that. I have no idea about Professor Vermeule these days. Um, he's not talking to me, uh, or he blocks me on Twitter and stuff. He's, he's kind of a thin skin guy. But in any case, he, um, um, you know, I think what we have learned from this crisis is that all crises are not alike, that the executive is not unbound, even in a crisis. And so as a paradigm for government in general strikes me as wrong. I don't think that the executive is unbound is, and that we're actually in a post-Madisonian world. And I suppose we're able to test that right now with the assault on our democracy, on our democratic election by essentially a set of corporate interests, you know, a media machine, um, as well as of course the, the, the current occupant of the White House. But, you know, if um, executive power was really unbound, you know, wouldn't that effort be much more likely to succeed? It turns out that if American democracy survives into January, it's going to be because of courts at the state level and the national level, at the federal level. It's going to be because of legislatures uh, who refuse the request to overturn their electoral um, votes of the, or, you know, to send alternative slates of electors. That one, we don't know it could happen, but it seems really unlikely. And it's going to be because of bureaucrats all over the country, right, who counted votes in accordance with the rule of law despite political pressure. And so I think this election also shows us that the executive is not unbound even in a crisis, um, even though you might say, well, the President Trump's response wasn't to try to take over the system, it was much more to pretend that the COVID wasn't the real thing. So that was kind of under underreach, not executive overreach. But the big point being that, you know, the executive did not and could not take over the system. All right, well, we're likely to see a lot of aftermath here. Um, a lot of elections were postponed now that they're beginning to be held, but there was a lot of election postponements. Um, it is often the case that during emergency rule, certain measures become permanent. And so for example, the fact that anyone who takes an airplane now has to go through those metal detectors, you know, that's just a result of September 11th. They didn't reduce those detectors when the threat of terrorism has receded. Um, and uh, France had a, you know, had a series of emergencies, emergency attacks, which generally lead to states of emergency when the police can, you know, be very aggressive. And so emergency rule is hard to get rid of. But that just suggests that the rule of law principles are ever more important during this time. Um, and I think maybe with that, I will stop and see if there's questions or comments about this um, and uh, hear what you, see what you guys all have to say now that you can see me and such. So I guess the theory is you raise your hand and if you don't, I'll just keep talking a little bit, I don't mind. Oh, yes, okay, so uh, there's a question about um, uh, emergency rule in the United States. Emergency rule in the United States is weird. Every other country would allow a declaration of a national emergency as a constitutional matter, which would provide a whole slew of powers 
in our world, our constitution is too old. They drafted it before they really thought much about it. There's only the provision on suspending habeas corpus, um, but they don't have a general system of emergency rule. And that's a big problem in some sense, but we do have many emergency statutes. And so President Trump has declared a lot of emergencies under things like the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. That's what allowed him to put on tariffs. Um, you know, there's emergency law, which was declared, he did, you know, very early in the COVID crisis, the Health and Human Services um, Department was able to invoke emergency principles in order to, or to, to declare a health emergency so that it could get care and PPE uh, e faster to people around the country. So, you know, there's been a lot of sort of um, emergency declarations, but they're at the statutory level and don't have such comprehensive reach. Generally speaking, the statutes put a lot of power in the president to make the determination. And that's a problem in a way. It is, you know, we have not had an example um, in which the declaration or the finding of an emergency has been set aside by a court. We have, because generally speaking, presidents don't abuse those. And I'm not sure, I wouldn't say that this president has abused those. But um, we do have sometimes findings that certain actions are not acceptable, even under the invocation of the emergency. So it's not the declaration. So the question is about termination. So it's not so much the termination thereof that matters. It's about calibrating the use and deployment of emergency powers. The very famous case in this regard is called Youngstown. Some of you may have heard of it, of it from the early 1950s when President Truman invoked uh, the emergency economic powers predecessor, that statute, to uh, seize all the steel mills in the United States for government production during the Korean War. And basically the court comes up with this framework in a very famous dissent by Justice Jackson, which sort of looks to whether Congress has really delegated this power to uh, to the executive, and it found in that case that it had not. So, you know, we do have a framework at, for, you know, preventing massive abuses, but it ultimately does depend on congressional checks. And Congress, we've learned, or we are really about to learn, is kind of incapable of acting during periods of divided, you know, when the houses are divided. So that's going to provide some opportunities for a lot of executive power. Now, I'm just gonna say one other big aftermath that I think we're gonna face is the, um, is, you know, around the world, obviously, is the economic consequences. Um, that's gonna be really significant. And that is also kind of something to take into account. So one way to frame the COVID crisis is that we have never experienced a simultaneously dim diminution of civil liberties in as many countries, you know, in human history. We had pretty good set of rights. Now all of a sudden, in virtually every country, freedoms of movement are constrained, sometimes freedoms of speech, freedoms of association, freedoms to practice religion. All of these things are under severe constraint, as Justice Alito reminded us the other day. And that's a real issue. So it becomes really important to make sure that the proportionality you know, is kind of um, kept into, in, in, proportionality concerns are kept into place. Um, and legality is followed. In our system in the United States, the power, the primary emergency power is with state governors. And if you read these state statutes, they give governors extremely broad power. They can do all kinds of things. They can interfere with the market. They can seize private, you know, uh, medical stuff. They can uh, regulate pricing. It, they have a massive amount of emergency powers. So, um, and you know, and they're temporarily limited, but we've had a number of cases, a couple of cases where governors have actually pushed beyond and invoked uh, extensions of the emergency, you know, even without going to a legislature or anything else. The statute in Illinois, for example, doesn't say anything about what happens after 30 days. So the gov governor Pritzker just said, well, okay, I'll just declare a new one or extend the old one. Uh, but What's happened, of course, is that they did relax a lot of their measures and now they're coming back again. So there's a kind of big question about the unconstrained government power, governor power. I would say, in my view, that um, 
obviously governor power is limited in a federal system. We do have federal courts that could protect the constitutional rights should they um, abuse them. And there's been a dialogue. In my view, it, it hasn't been unreasonable that we've had basically, you know, some slight disagreements over things like can gun shops be subject to the, uh, you know, lockdown. Okay. Um, basically what happened, there, as far as I know, not even any cases about that. Because when the NRA said, hey, you can lock down everybody, but you can't lock down the gun shops, you know, most governors just said, okay, okay, we're not going to bother with that. So in other words, that's a political set of constraints. The governors are constrained politically. And this, of course, is what Posner and Vermeule would say as well, that the law doesn't do any work, that it's the political constraints that really matter. And they, you know, they're right. Those political constraints, of course, are important. But I guess my argument is that law also matters, right? We do see legal constraints. And of course, very hard to measure. But just from the observed data of countries putting up things, measures that then they had to back off of, or being forced to adopt measures that they didn't want to, the law and legal institutions are mattering. One problem with the line of research, that the paper, is that it's impossible for me and my co-author to say whether one or the other, you know, the amount of legality is creating what you'd call a good response, right? We really don't know much about what a good response is. I mean, a good response clearly is something like they had in Taiwan, which was short, effective, quite draconian for a very short period. And now people are in cafes and bars and you know everything's more or less normal. So that you could say is a good response. But in the United States, once we had let it out of control, it's hard to know what a good response is because of course, as now is being talked about a lot, the lockdowns have their own costs, you know, increase in violence and suicide and uh, gun use. And of course the mental health effects, which may be with us for decades. So um, I don't know because I don't know what the right response is. I'm not, I don't think anyone knows what the, you know, that there's a single optimal one. Now, my general epistemic lack of confidence in general, by the way, and not just, but, but particularly about uh, this issue leads me to then say, well, maybe the answer of what's a good response, you know, what's the trade-off of risk to human life versus the other collateral effects of the lockdown, economic and otherwise, maybe that just varies from society to society. And we, you know, the, what we can say then is that as societies work this out themselves, they are doing so through a political and constitutional and legal dialogue that involves multiple branches of government, which if you think about it is probably gonna to lead to a better solution than any one branch determining the whole story in and of itself, right? So I basically think that this is probably the right way to do it given a situation of extreme, um, you know, epistemic uncertainty about what would work to, to stop the violence. Uh, Matthew. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, so, I mean, I think this is kind of spinning off some of the things you've just stated, but, um, you know, one of the things that I think is a big discussion about going forward is uh, kind of a buzzword. It's like this idea of preparedness and pandemic preparedness being a big thing looking to, towards the future. Um, you know, and one could imagine that the problem in many places might not be like gross executive overreach, but it might be just this kind of incremental um, you know, incremental movement where the executive is doing just a little bit more and a little bit more over time in the name of preparedness for the next big one. Um, you know, and maybe that's something that, that legislature should, should kind of try and rein back a little bit, but I don't know if you have any comment on that. Um, but then on the other side, you know, maybe that could be a kind of policy lever where, um, you know, we're using that kind of preparedness to, to um, try and implement positive public health measures that, that we actually want. Um, in the future. So I, I wonder if you have any comment on like kind of the, the downsides of that or, or maybe if there are some benefits. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. So like, how do we prevent this in the future? And that obviously is not something that courts are going to have much of a role in. Um, I think it implicates federalism quite a bit, right, in our country. Like, we have learned that, you know, local governments constitutionally are the primary responders. But when you have certain kinds of crises like this one, you know, they're not going to be sufficient on their own. And as we saw, there was like competition. They were outbidding each other for PPE and such. The federal government is supposed to play a coordinating role. I'm not 
sure that they did a great job from my perspective. We saw um, you know, a couple instances where the federal, the HHS came in and seized equipment from, for example, the state of Maryland, which has a Republican governor, I wanna emphasize. Um, you know, they had bought some stuff and the federal government came in and took it. So a lot of sort of error and bad coordination. And that's the kind of thing which a plan can help you with. Um, now, on the other hand, the federal government, you know, did have a unique role in motivating the vaccine companies. And that seems to have been very successful, I think, um, in the sense like, wow, we're going to have a vaccine. Well, apparently we do already. And it's just a matter of production and distribution. So giving the uh, private companies the incentives to, to do that work, you know, seems to have been a good response. Um, so all of that said, having a framework for it would be a wonderful thing. And if we could adopt a general pandemic statute or something like that in the aftermath of this, to clarify the roles of the different bodies, I think it would be a good thing. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, like everything is right now going to be involved quite a bit in politics. Maybe it's something where if the Republicans win the Senate, you know, McConnell and Biden could get together on. Um, because, yeah, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that we can. Um, so my video is frozen, I guess. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Well, I can't tell if anyone can hear me now. Someone say something. We could hear you. Okay, that's great, but you can't see me. All right. I have no, no idea. I'm sitting in my law school office, so there's not a, I'm doing my best here. Um, let me see if there's other other questions. Oh, here's one from on the on the chat. So, okay, Alberto asks whether or not we should. Uh, there's been discussion about amending the Constitution. So, in general, U.S. Constitution is super hard to amend, which generally has a lot of problems in terms of meaning that the document is quite out of date, but has a good feature from my point of view that it couldn't be abused. For example, to you know. Um, you know, extend the term of the president or something like that, you know, so there's, there's kind of a trade off there. There is an effort to amend the Constitution using the other mechanism that's found in Article 5. Article 5 requires, has two mechanisms, one that all of us learn, which is two thirds of each House of Congress and then three quarters of the states. But there is this other mechanism, which is called a constitutional convention. And that allows two thirds of states through their legislatures to call for a new constitutional convention, which would then write, you know, either an amendment or maybe a whole new constitution. And so that's an opportunity to fix a lot of things. Um, and there's, you know, this is the least of them, but there's many, many problems with the American constitution, let me assure you. Um, so what should we think about that? Well, actually it's very interesting because there's actually right now, I think, what would you need? 34 states. And there's about 31 states right now that have made some kind of call for this uh, amendment convention. Um, but many of them are limited. So that, for example, back when the Tea Party was a thing, for those of you who remember that, um, there was a whole wave of Republican dominated states which called for a balanced budget amendment to the US Constitution. And so many of the calls are restricted to the issue of adopting a balanced budget amendment. There's one uh, call, I think it is Maryland, which says we want to have a constitutional convention to overturn the Citizens United decision, which is a campaign finance decision, which allows sort of unlimited private spending. And so um, two sides, different priorities. Um, and who knows what would happen if they were to say, well, let's come particularly since the balanced budget idea seems to be rather quaint at this point. But um, I also don't think in the end, it's a very good idea. Think about how polarized the country is now. Do you think we could actually come together to agree on, you know, constitutional amendments, which would be improving our governance system? There are many things we could do to do so. We could have better accountability mechanisms. We could probably get, make a, you know, introducing ranked choice voting, which a lot of electoral experts think is really a good thing. Um, you know, reducing the terms of the Supreme Court, um, the emergency regime, lots of things to be fixed. But the fact is, if we got together now, we would probably be fighting over, you know, you know, abortion or something like that. We wouldn't be focusing our energies on a, 
on a problem that we could solve through discourse and say, I think we're kind of stuck with what we've got. Um, so another question is, is there going to be a round of state constitutional changes? That's a great question. That's a really great question. So state constitutions change much more frequently than the national one. Some states have had seven, as many as seven. I think Georgia's had seven constitutions. So there's, um, and many states have a provision whereby every tw uh, 20 years, the voters are called on to ask whether they should write a new constitution. And sometimes they say yes. So there's a lot more change at the state level and they've got a lot of things in there, which we don't have at the federal level, rights to education and things like that. So, um, and obviously neutral electoral administration, that's something many states have. So that is a good channel. I think that's a great channel actually um, for thinking about good government reforms here for how to deal with elections. I, the statute I read didn't seem to have very good legislative oversight of the governor's powers, very, very executive heavy. Now, maybe that's okay because there is not just state court, but federal court oversight. Um, that limits what governors can do. But, you know, you, I would like to see perhaps, you know, anything that involves thinking in advance before the next um, crisis, I think would be a, an excellent thing. Because unfortunately, this is probably not going to be the last pandemic, at least that's not what the medical people seem to think. That means we all better be thinking about it.